Hi folks, this is Ken Michaels. First of all, just want to say thanks to all of you for your support of Things We Said Today. Today's edition is actually divided into two parts. The first is a phone conversation with our special guest, Patty Boyd. And right after that, we go into our conversation discussing the latest news on Ringo and Paul. So, sit back and enjoy our latest show, and thanks again for listening to Things We Said Today. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Marinucci, and welcome to uh, another edition of Things We Said Today, uh, our weekly Beatles show where we talk about uh, anything and everything related to the Beatles. And I want to first introduce my three co-hosts. Um, there's uh, Al Sussman from Beatle Fan. Al? Hi, Steve. Hello, everybody. Ken Michaels, a uh, host of Things We Said Today. I'm of uh, Every Little Thing. Hi, Steve. Hi, everyone. And also from Beatle fan, uh, Alan Cozen. Um, hello, Steve, and hello, everyone. And we have a very special guest on the line from England. We want to welcome to the show Patty Boyd. Patty, uh, mm-hmm. welcome to Things We Said Today. Thank you very much. Hello, and hello, everybody else. Uh, let me pop the first question, and then we'll go around the table. The reason for this interview is what you're going to be doing in San Francisco um, in a couple of weeks. And why don't we discuss that? You're going to have an exhibit at the San Francisco Art Exchange, and you're also going to be appearing there. Uh, you want to talk about that? Yes. I'm, I'm going to arrive on about the 11th or 12th of February, and then the exhibition starts on the Saturday, the 14th, which is, of course, a very romantic day. Mm-hmm. And um, my exhibition starts, and it's on until the end of March. What is fantastic is that my very first exhibition ever in the entire world was 10 years ago at the San Francisco Art Exchange. I remember, you know, I remember that. I remember that very well. Do you really? have, yes, I do. I didn't go up there, but I do remember, I do remember you, were there, uh, you were there. But one thing that I, I noticed in the press release is that you're going to have a painting that, has, that you've had in your house. Yes that you have not exhibited before, and, and talk about that. Yeah, well, uh, Theron had an idea. He knew that I had the painting of Layla, the original painting, and I've had it forever, for years and years, and um, he thought it might be a fun idea if I would lend it to the gallery for the uh, duration of the exhibition. So I sent it over. He's thrilled. He said it looks really nice, and so I'm happy to do that. Is the painting there now? Are, is the, are they, is? Have they already started exhibiting? Okay. I might go no, up, they haven't might started go exhibiting. They have it, but I, I, don't, I doubt he's exhibiting it yet, but I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. Let, me, let me go around the table. Al, how about you? Hi, Patty. How are you today? I'm fine, Alan. How are you? Good, good. What to ask you about? Because uh, obviously you're certainly aware that, uh, uh, especially for those of us here in America, there's like a mm-hmm. whole generation of uh, what were teenage boys for whom you were a major crush. But you also yeah. were kind of one of the symbols of, you know, swinging London and the pop scene uh, back in in the mid '60s. And I was wondering if you can kind of describe some of that. Uh, for people, because that may also kind of play into your exhibition as well. Well, I mean, it was it was absolutely fantastic during that period, um, and some people called it a bit of a hippie period, but it wasn't really. I mean, it was quite chic, you know, hippie chic. And um, we used to really dress up and hang out on the King's Road in Chelsea, and Carnaby Street was another street that um, everybody seemed to go to. And um, quite a few of our friends owned little boutique shops selling the most amazing, colorful clothes. And um, it was a really exciting, wonderful time. Um, there, it wasn't um, overcrowded. It was just really cool. Everybody seemed to be cool. The boys were growing their hair longer. So you could tell who was sort of like the accountant types and who were the, like the cool guys. And, uh, you know, it was fun. It was really fun. Absolutely. Was there a I'm sense that sure we, we often hear that that you could barely, uh, you guys could barely walk on the street? Though, I mean, was is is that overstated, or were you able to actually go out and spend time in this scene that you just described? Well, at the beginning, particularly the beginning of my relationship with George, we were okay, you know, um, without being mobbed or recognised, and it wasn't that crowded. But I think, you know, as 
as they became a little more well known, then we said he could, certainly couldn't do that. And um, and in those days, we would just go out and hang out with my friends in the evening. So we wouldn't actually go to public pre- uh, places like restaurants because it was just too annoying. But, um, I know people couldn't resist it because it's irresistible to see someone you know or you think you know and they're famous and you want an autograph. But, I mean, the whole evening would be full of people coming up with pieces of paper and what, requesting autographs and photographs. And so it was just um, a, a bit annoying for us. So we didn't do that any longer. Okay. Alan, <laughs> yeah, you, did, you. did you have a question? Well, I guess, you know, back to the to the photographs. Um, I, I know that you've been doing photography for a very long time, and on your, there's a, a, a web page with some of your photographs that go way back. Um, mm-hmm. When did you begin thinking of it as sort of an artistic endeavor? rather than, you know, just taking snapshots of <coughs> places you went and people you were with? Um, probably 11 years ago, because somebody in England, in London, approached me and suggested that I must have some rather interesting photographs because of my life. And um, I said, and he thought it might be nice for an exhibition, and I said, really and truly, I'm sure I have no more than three or four, really not <laughs> worth an exhibition. And he said, have a look. And I was rather reluctant to do this because by looking at photographs, we all know they are so um, so emotive that I knew that if I started looking at all these photographs, it could take me such a long time and I'd have to go through smiles as well as tears. Anyway, I got myself together and um, decided that I would look through old boxes and envelopes and uh, cupboards and drawers and wherever and more and more and more photographs emerged and so that's how it began I realized that maybe I people might be interested in my photographs and it was a real for me it was such a risk to have that first exhibition in San Francisco because you know I mean I, I, I felt that people might be annoyed that I'm showing some photographs that perhaps could be considered rather intimate and then I thought, oh, blow it. <laughs> if the guy who asked me in the first place, if he thought they were all right, let's go for it. And, and so I did. And, um, and still, you know, it's really odd. Even, I don't know, six months ago, I, I discovered that I'd got some others that I'd overlooked somehow. Mm-hmm. So you've, um, you've written a, a, a very fascinating autobiography. Has it occurred to you to put out a collection of your photographs? You know, I would love to do that dearly. And um, I was approached by a publishing house called Rizzoli, which is American. They're based in New York. This was towards the end of last year. And um, they never really came back. And I don't know what to do, whether they are still interested or not. Or not. Maybe I should get hold of them. Anyway, I think I'm going to see somebody in San Francisco while I'm there, another publishing house. But this is what I would dearly like to do, because obviously there are far more photographs of, you know, I mean, interesting and fun and amusing uh, situations. Mm-hmm. Ken? Okay, um, Patty, um, I really enjoyed looking at the photos, especially the ones that Steve posted on his website for his article. There's a nice slideshow that, that he presented there. And apart from the fact that many of the yeah. photos are of very famous people, they really have an artistic flair to them. Did you always approach your photography that way? I mean, in particular, there's one, there's, there's one photo that I really love of George looking over a hill. It looks like it's from when your time in India. And yeah. it's like he's looking over a hut, and it's very artistic. So, you know, how do you approach all of your photography even early on? Um, I... You know, when I was very young, i.e. when I was 18, 19, I was a model and did a lot of work for fashion magazines, etc. And my friends at the time were all photographers. And they encouraged me to look at, you know, photography books and see how other photographers photograph. And they were very instrumental in encouraging me and um, in kind of encouraging me and in a way showing me what to look for in a photograph, how to, how to take a photograph. And um, so it's been a, a case of 
being observant of wonderful works of art, and I suppose if you continually do that, a little bit of it rubs into your own psyche. Hmm. I think. I don't know how else to explain what I do. <laughs> okay. There's some beautiful photos you've taken. Thank you very much. What I've done this time, actually, besides all the uh, well-known people that I photographed, I have um, also a selection of work that I've done recently, which I thought could be interesting. For example, I've got a couple of actors, an actor and an actress, and one fashion shot, and some flowers. So it just that would just be a little aside on a little bit of a wall, I think, I hope, somewhere in the gallery, just to show what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. Do you have any plans of, of moving the, the exhibit to the East Coast in any way? Because I'd love to, to see it. Oh, you are so sweet to say that, but um, <laughs> I haven't got any plans, and if anybody would like to approach me, please feel free. <laughs> because the only gallery that I know of on the East Coast is uh, the Morrison Hotel Gallery. And I know that they're pretty busy most of the time, so I don't know if they would have... It just needs a, for a gallery to invite me, and then I will say yes. Okay. We'll have to work on that. <laughs> yeah, but it's, yeah, good. Please do. Until that time, I really don't have any plans. Okay. Patty, let me, let me ask. Um, a friend of mine called me after, the, or contacted me after seeing the slideshow I'd put up and asked about the last wall's picture uh, because uh, he asked where that was, and I said that's where it was. Were You, you were at the last wall's? <laughs> yeah, because I took that photograph. Right. Yeah, because a lot. I don't. I don't know that that had ever come out before. Um, what did you think of the the concert? Oh, to me, it. I, I have the DVD. It is one of the most wonderful, wonderful um, films and music. I mean, just it was really. I still adore it. I absolutely adore it. It was Martin Scorsese. I think maybe it was one of his first um, music ventures. Mm-hmm. I think it's beautiful, and I've always been a major fan of of uh, the band. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah, they're they're fantastic. I I agree so with fun. you. There. I've always loved. Yeah, them. So, loved and, them. yeah, and so artistic and so cool and um, talented, and you know, totally wonderful. Were there any preparations in advance? Because obviously, Eric played. Was that a last moment thing that Eric went there, or, or yes. was that a, no, no, it was a, a last, long time? Yeah. It, it was a last, it, sorry last to, minute thing? Sorry to interrupt you. Yes, it was a last minute thing. He was on tour uh, in America anyway, and then we flew to San Francisco specifically for that, mm-hmm. for that show. Yeah. Al? <laughs> Patty, uh, going back to um, the uh, the photos, as a matter of fact, or your mm-hmm. involvement with uh, with photography. You mentioned the fact that that it was the the photographers you worked with as a model who kind of got you interested in doing photography yourself. And it seems mm-hmm. that in those days, I guess photography was almost like it was kind of like the uh, sort of um, a leisure occupation of a lot of of a lot of the pop stars of the day. You know, when you see pictures of the Beatles, quite often they're carrying cameras. And as we know from Ringo's book, obviously he took a lot, and and the others uh, uh, always seem to have cameras around with them. Is that was that kind of by design, or you know? It was, you know, I don't know. That's interesting. I hadn't really thought about it before. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, everybody loves photographs. Everybody loves photographs. But I I suppose, you know, um, I don't know what started the rush to buy cameras, but everybody seemed to have a camera. And I remember Paul having uh, a little, a big movie camera, because they're all so small now. Mm -hmm. Um, Sure. Yeah, Yeah, it's almost as if they were kind of like the gadgets of the day. Yes, I think so. They were the new toys. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Exactly. Mm. But what was good, they're boy toys and girl toys. So um, <laughs> yeah. we'd all use them. <laughs> but you all seem Alan? to have the same toys. Really? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so, Patty, when you photograph now, um, do you use digital equipment, or do you still like the sort of hands-on of, um, you know, the old cameras with developer and the whole process of, 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 of developing, you know, by hand? I, I, I now take digital photographs, and I have done for the last five years, I think. And it was a very, very sad day when I finally had to say goodbye to my dark room. I still haven't taken everything out. I've still got mine larger. I've got rid of the chemicals and the paper, but um, I can't get rid of the enlarger. It's just too, it's such a, it plays such a big part in all my printing and, you know, bringing up images and the fun I used to have. It's rather a lonely occupation, but there's something so wonderfully satisfying about producing that print finally. When I look back on it now, I think, how on earth did I have the time to do all of that? How did I have time to spend hours in the darkroom? But I suppose the reply to that is that I spend hours on the computer, you know, with all right. the different um, um, apps that you can use, like Lightroom or Aperture or whatever it is. You're still, you can still spend a lot of time with your digital photographs. It's not the same. You know, it's not atmospheric because you don't have the dreadful, naughty smell of all the chemicals. And um, it's just different, that's all. It's just really different. Mm -hmm. okay. You don't think you'll ever go back to the old way then? You say you've gotten rid of all the chemicals and everything. However, I still had my film cameras. I've still got a Hasselblad and a Nikon. And I know that I can use a friend's darkroom if I want to, if I want to, you know, just run through a roll of film. Mm -hmm. And you still have that enlarger, as you say. Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, over to Ken. Okay. Do you mind if I bring up George's music? Not at all, Ken. Okay. I was just curious if you got to see George write songs as it was happening, or was he pretty much very private when it came to that? Did he like to work alone, or did you, uh, you know, get to see a song take shape as he's writing it? And there, are there any um, in particular that you can think of? whether in the Beatle days or in, in the early years of his solo career? Yes, I mean, in the Beatle days, I used to watch him writing. He would just write on pieces of paper, and, you know, scribble out and then rewrite and then... Um... See, what he would do, first of all, was to get a melody. So he just plays guitar, play, 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 and then he'd find a melody, and then once he had the melody, he would have to write the song. Sometimes he found it quite difficult to put words that would you know would make sense or he would enjoy so sometimes it's difficult sometimes i try and help him not always great help but sometimes i did anyway that's how that's how it worked mm -hmm. can you think of a good line that you came up with no i mean i i remember him do, writing that song about it was actually a box of chocolates that we had and you know sometimes with a box of chocolates you can get an illustration describing what they are, and, give, and you know, and it gives them names. And so he wrote a song um, based on all these chocolates. And so, you know, we had fun playing around with that. <laughs> hmm. Did he tend to? Or is she talking demos? about Savoy Truffle there? Excuse me. That's right. Did oh, well he done. tend to record demos? Yes. What what he would do is he'd play on his little cassette machine, and then take that cassette tape into the studio so they could all hear and uh, you know then they would they would all decide whether they could work on it or not and if they couldn't then George would store it because you know the day would come which it obviously did when um, he could bring out all these old songs that he'd written and put it all on one album or two okay Steve uh, Patty how is uh, Wilfred Bramble to work with Wilfred Bramble Oh my God, He's, he was, um, you know, he'd been an actor all of his life and he knew what was happening and he knew the ropes and he was um, not terribly approachable, really, I didn't think. Hmm. But, but um, why do you ask that? I didn't really care that much. Why do you ask? That's a funny question. I, no, I, I, I was just, I was just kind of, uh, I mean, I, he was in the movie and, and, um, and I thought maybe that you had some interact might have had some interaction with him, you know, off screen. No, or he was. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, as an actor, he was quite a kind of quiet man. Just when he was acting, and he was sort of, 
he was quite amusing and funny. But you know, without his lines and without acting, he was he really was quite rather quiet. Okay, Al Sussman. Patty, uh, to follow up on what Ken was asking about uh, about George's music, you're probably aware that just recently a, a box set of his uh, Apple Records um, solo albums was released, yeah. and I was wondering if you had had a chance at all to listen to any of that and if, uh, if it brought back any particular memories or thoughts. No, I, you know, I had no idea that a box set had come out, and um, I really look forward to um, getting it. I guess I'll have to go onto Amazon and um, try and get it that way. Is it out in America first? Do you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, maybe it's out in England too, but I haven't seen any mention of it in the papers. Mm-hmm. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah it was out before yeah, Christmas, I mean, Patty. Before Christmas, really? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, okay. I'll have to hunt it down. No, I'd love to hear that. Are have they remastered them, or are they, they just putting it as a box set? Um, well, the, actually, I think they are. The individual albums are available separately, along with the box, along with as a box. Okay. All right. Yeah. And and okay. just to follow up, are there any particular uh, memories that you have of of those? You know, especially the solo, the solo sessions. From the um, 70s. Well, what? Which songs I like? I mean, I always yeah, loved "Why My Guitar yeah, Gently Weeps." Songs that, yeah. Yeah, "Why My Why My Guitar Gently Weeps." I think is one of George's finest. It was so beautiful, and um, yeah, there were so many. God, I'd love to hear this um, this new box set, just as a reminder. It also includes some albums that people probably rarely hear these days and don't think about much, but you would have been around for the, the genesis of, which is um, Wonderwall and Electronic Sound. Do you have any particular memories of him doing those? Because Electronic Sound in particular is sort of odd for him. Now, Wonderwall, that was for a film, wasn't it? Right. Mm-hmm. Movie. Yeah. It's some of yeah. it in India. And, yeah. Yes, I don't really have tremendous memories of that, but obviously I knew it was he was doing it, but I don't really recall where he was doing it or, you know, my reaction or anything, actually. Sorry. Okay. Or the electronic one as well, Electronic Sounds, was uh, uh, two very long synthesizer pieces. Oh, really? It's funny, you know. Suddenly, it's kind of like it's kind of like a fashion. Suddenly, they all love the synthesizer and wanted it on everything. And then it, you know, like just like fashion, it was kind of thrown away, and then they didn't use it again. Mm. Um, what do you remember of um, when George got involved with Indian philosophy, and and you, I believe, as well? In fact, I think it might you might have actually run into the Maharishi first. Well, I didn't actually run into him, but I ran into what I discovered was um, that I could attend a lecture about um, transcendental meditation. And I discovered this while George and the others were uh, on tour in Australia. So I went and I was initiated because I learned how to meditate. And I went with a girlfriend and we went for several sessions. And then when when they came back, I told George about it, obviously. And he was really interested. And then uh, it seemed like the same time or the next day, Paul phoned to say that Maharishi was coming to London. And I said, this is who I've been talking about. And Paul was very keen to see him or to listen to what he was saying. And, uh, you know, in those days, if one of the Beatles did something, they all did it together. So we all went along to, to, hear, to hear him speak. Do you still meditate? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Patty, from what you observed about George... Like like all people, I, I think he was very complex. And I want to just bring up the whole idea of when he was in the Beatles, was he frustrated being in the Beatles because of all that you hear about him being held back by having just a couple of songs per album? Or did he really love being in the Beatles? Or was it really a little of both from what you observed about him? I think initially he loved being in the Beatles. And as time went on and fame seemed to attack them all 
it was um, anyway he then realized and complained to me that you know he's only allowed two two of his tracks on each album and he was really annoyed and frustrated by this it was almost as if they were holding him back and um but i don't think they were deliberately holding him back holding him back i think that paul and john were just so they were just so overcome with their creativity and the songs that they were writing. They were just full up and bursting, and they had to get them out. And, you know, and they were all being so young, was sort of not really sensitive to George, who was there saying, well, listen to me, listen to mine. Um, it, it was uh, a, a deep frustration for him. Mm. So just, uh, I'd like to just ask you one thing about All Things Must Pass and about the sessions for that. Was George very, did he feel very liberated doing it, being away from the Beatles, or was there some trepidation there because this was, aside from Wonderwall music and, and electronic sound, the first time he really stepped out? And then, to follow up on that, when the album really exploded worldwide the way it did, what was his reaction to it all? Was he really kind of taken aback by it? Did he expect anything close yes. to that kind of success? No, he didn't. He was taken aback by it. Um, but he so enjoyed doing it and working with all the musicians he did, all the musicians he loved. Hmm. And I, I think he just sort of hoped it would, might do well, but I, th I think it you know, was quite mind-blowing for him that it you know, was so explosive. Sure. Hmm. But while he was doing the recording sessions, was there any part of him that was afraid to step out like this? Because you know, no, he was part so. of the biggest band in the world. I know. But what it was doing to him personally, it didn't make him feel that good because, you know, he knew he had to, all this other material. Sure. Absolutely. Patty, thank you very much for, for being on the show with us. We And yeah. this was a lot of fun. And I hope we can talk to you again sometime. That would be very nice. And it was lovely talking to you all. And okay. I'm sorry about the time factor, but there we are. We can't, um, we can't That's do everything, okay. can we? Yeah. That's okay. Thank you very much. Right. We, we, okay. we, 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 it was great having you on the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Okay. Patty. Th thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. Well, we're, we're back on the show. Uh, after uh, thank, Again, thank Patty Boyd for, for being with us. Um, uh, I thought we'd talk about um, a couple of things that have happened since the last show. The first thing would be Ringo's new album that he announced last week, uh, Postcards from Paradise. Um, I mean, this is something we've kind of known about for a while, but they finally, he finally uh, made it official. And I'm glad to see it. Uh, I've seen some, you know, comments from people saying, you know, it really doesn't matter a whole lot uh, because Ringo's uh, albums haven't been great. But I disagree. I think the last album is, last couple albums have been fantastic. And so I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, uh, Al, you want to talk about this first? Well, you know, I'm not sure the last couple of albums have been fantastic, but uh, but you know they uh, they certainly they're you know they've certainly been very listenable, and obviously this will be kind of consistent with the last couple of albums in that Ringo is basically recording them in a sense at home. Well, he is literally recording them at home. You know, on his on uh, on his system there with Pro Tools and all, and um, uh, it seems to uh, it seems to work well. You know, sort of uh, the the format of you know if uh, you know if a musical friend is in the neighborhood, he uh, drops by and contributes to the album, which is kind of the formula that he's used of, with the last uh, I guess the last two albums as well. And mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be. Uh, it should be. Uh, should be interesting. It's. Uh, it, it's almost like a parallel, kind of like a parallel universe to, um, to the All Star Band concept. Except that I believe this time there will be more in the way of contributions from the members of the current All Star Band. Than right. There's one. There's one song on the album, as I recall, and I'm, I'm looking it up now. From the All Star Band, uh, which actually he has not done before, he's used members of the All Star Band, but not the uh, exact, uh, not right, use not the band in, specifically in one, on, yeah. on one track. Um, exactly. I was disappointed that there's no covers. I actually like the covers he did on the last couple albums. 
and I was uh, a little surprised that there is none this time. But we'll see what he we'll see what he comes up with. Um, um, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to hearing it. Uh, and, and I obviously the first track you notice is the Rory and the Hurricanes track, which is yeah. you know, right. but uh, kind of just you know off past performance you would kind of figure is probably almost like a sequel to you know to the more autobiographical songs on the last right Liber- liverpool eight and, and those yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. in liverpool yeah. right the other in liverpool. side of liverpool <laughs> <laughs> we could make some jokes but no i don't i don't think that's probably i don't think we will but yeah uh alan did you have a comment about um um, well, you know, I don't really know too much about what – I've seen the track list, of course, and, and naturally the Rory and the Hurricanes sort of jumped out for the reasons you mentioned. Um, that does seem to be a, a, a series he he has going of uh, musical autobiographical tracks. I don't know. To me, that seems – on one hand, they're sort of interesting, and on the other hand, it, it seems sort of like a almost too easy way to write a song, you know? Um, mm-hmm. It's sort of not, you know, when you think of songs, you think of songwriting in the way that uh, Lennon and McCartney and even Harrison did. It's, you know, they're coming up with things that people can cover, you know, that, that have an independent life of, of, of their own beyond it mm-hmm. being Ringo singing about Ringo's past. I wonder whether a lot of these songs that Ringo is doing that are autobiographical are things that anybody could possibly cover or want to cover, really. Um, You know, and that's, I guess, one one approach to songwriting, um, you know, whether whether songwriting really needs to be for the ages and whether it really needs to be for anybody to do is, is, I guess, an open question. But it traditionally has been, you know, that's usually been the goal of songwriters. I agree that you know his covers were were often pretty interesting, and uh, it's it's a pity there aren't any of those. But um, you know, with Ringo's recent albums, I, I I agree they've been a little hit and miss, but they've been, you know, they've they've been fairly consistently enjoyable, even if they're not spectacular. Um, mm-hmm. And and I think even you know even his earlier albums, I, I went back recently and listened to a bunch of them and even things like you know roto gravure and ringo the fourth which i remember really not having much use for at the time they came out possibly listening to them maybe once back then um when i put them on i thought you know actually these aren't so bad they've each got a a bunch of of strong tracks and uh you know the production's okay and it's uh, i think they actually survive better than we may think they did Hmm. That's, uh, yeah, I'm, I, <laughs> you, know, you, kind of, you could say that about all the solo Beatle albums. They all have worthwhile tracks on them. And um, for me Even personally, the, the, what's that? Even Life with the Lions. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did it again. He did it again. <laughs> two, mi- two minutes of silence is a flawless. Two minutes of silence. That's right. But that's true. That's true. I think John Cage has a lawsuit there. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's an homage. True. But I definitely would say that, um, you know, the last couple of Ringo albums, there is a, a real big difference that I found in uh, the last two albums from him compared to the work that he did with Mark Hudson and the Roundheads. Sure. I mean, definitely the way that Ringo has worked in recent years on these last two albums, as Al has said, it's more or less pretty much at a leisurely pace. You know, he records whenever he feels like it, and if there are friends of his in town and, and they want to work on the songs, as, as Ringo has said, you're on the record. So as opposed to when he had somebody like Mark Hudson and members of the Roundheads there, it probably was done on a more concentrated period of time, and probably they tried to get things done within a few months, and they all worked together. So uh, in, a, in one way, you know, I like both approaches. And I certainly feel like the production on the last couple of Ringo albums is very different because you can certainly hear the drums more up front, and um, it has a much brighter sound to it. And I like 
the, the production on the last couple of albums. But by the same token, I do miss the group effort of Mark and, and the Roundheads. I think they, they really work well with Ringo. And apart from the Ringo album from 73, which is a classic, I still feel that the best work that Ringo's done has been with Mark Hudson and the Roundheads. But all of the solo albums have worthwhile songs on them. And in particular, you know, I really find it far more interesting now that Ringo co-writes just about every single song, all the songs on his albums. Whether it's with two, three, four, or five people, he has some hand in songwriting which I find really interesting. You know, he really enjoys that side of the music, whereas through the years, certainly in the Beatle years, he only had a couple of songs. And then in the 70s, he worked with Vinnie Pons. He has a songwriter for a while. But nowadays, he, he co-writes just about everything on his album. So from that perspective, I find his music to be really interesting, just knowing that he's so much more involved in that side of it. And I really like when he does collaborate with different people, like Van Dyke Parks, for example. I love the song Samba that was on the last album. Or working with Richard Marks, you know, he wrote a song with him. You know, I like when Ringo works with different people and writes with different people, and it brings out different styles in his music. Uh -huh. he's, so um, He's really he's really come to the, he's really, you know, uh, it seemed like with the Mark Hudson stuff, he was still taking kind of a back seat, whereas now, the, the, like you say, the, the sound is brighter, and and you know the whole out, outlook and attitude on the albums is completely is different, and um, and I like it too. I think it's I think it's much better now than it was. Um, you like his music I've, better in the last few albums than with Mark Hudson? Yeah, I do. I do. I you know outside of um, God, I can't think of the name of it now. The one that uh, everybody li really really liked. Um, I have Vertical it right Man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, outside of Vertical Man, um, which which is a spectacular album, you know, the last couple have been great. And uh, the you know the one thing that people have always said about Ringo albums is he you put them out and and you know you listen to them a couple times and that's it. But that's really not been the case with Ringo's albums. They've had a lot more to me. They've had a lot more longevity than I think sometimes people give them credit for. Um, yeah, I, I think what may have what may have happened, particularly with the uh, the Mark Hudson albums, is that as uh, as he got further into the relationship, you know, musically, that Ringo became almost kind of just like the singer, and they were really almost more Mark Hudson albums, especially with mm -hmm. all of the the various little Beatle references and things like that, that that you know you figure Ringo wouldn't have really done himself I think he might have been almost embarrassed to slip in all these little references himself hmm. so they really were more reflective of of Mark Hudson than of Ringo whereas obviously these two or these last three albums I guess uh are uh, you know are really more more Ringo's own you know, kind of organic albums, um, you know, organically built, as I said, using the, uh, you know, the at-home studio format. It's uh, it, it seems to be a lot more natural and seems to be much more reflective of Ringo himself as a musician. I still think there's some help going on there, but I, I do believe oh, sure. he's taken more control. He's taken more okay. control than... He did. He did when Mark Hudson was around, um, yeah, oh. and I think that's that's definitely a good thing. I mean, he's, you know, the whole All Star Band concept, you know, leads to that conclusion anyway. That he's got, and you know, we've heard stories. I, I you know, I've uh, I remember when I when I talked to Edgar Winter about how he led the uh, how he you know what kind of a uh, uh, hierarchy Ringo had over the All Star Band. I mean, there is definitely a you know, a, a difference. I mean, Ringo is actually is definitely a leader uh, there, and so he's definitely he's in charge, and and that's and I think that extends to the albums too. So, hmm. well, I, I do like what you said there, Al, about the Ringo's albums being more organic now. Um, yes. If there's any criticism that I would make of the, the Mark Hudson albums is that it was too Beatley. You know, I mean, Mark Hudson's approach was you are a beetle you know don't be ashamed of it <laughs> mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know, uh, it's going to come out in the music anyway. But I think with Mark, it might have been overdone at times. So yeah. I don't know if that was, you know, the biggest reason why they parted ways. But, um, you know, definitely uh, I do I do like the last few albums from Ringo. I just think sometimes, and there are some people who feel that Ringo needs some kind of anchor, someone to guide him along instead of taking complete control. And the songs that he worked on with Mark Hudson, I just think were very strong songs that mm-hmm. worked really well and were arranged really well. And the band itself, not just Mark, but having Gary Burr there and Steve Dudas, really fine musicians that, that seemed to really work well with Ringo. And um, you even kind of felt that certainly by the time of Choose Love, that they were a really tight band. Mm-hmm that they really worked well in the studio together. And Ringo even said that he kind of missed that closeness of having a band in the studio with the same musicians working together. And I kind of felt, you know, that those albums, especially, well, the three core ones, Vertical Man, Ringo Rama, and and Choose Love, were all strong. And by the time of Choose Love, it really felt like a band. So if you like the band aspect of it all, then you probably would prefer the work with Mark Hudson. If you like Ringo experimenting on his own and taking full charge, and you probably prefer more of what he's doing in recent years. But I do really like his production on his albums, and you know, all like like I just said, all all the solo albums from all the Beatles have a lot of worthwhile material on them. So the last few from Ringo are no exception. Hmm. Let me um, um, switch over to something that uh, happened today. Um, just get your comments briefly on the announcement this morning that uh, Paul's going to be playing with uh, Kanye West and Rihanna at the Grammys. You know, uh, there's a been uh, there's a lot of I've been watching the comments on Facebook this morning, and you know, there's comments both ways. You know, it, this really doesn't bother me. I don't know why, but it I don't really it's not really uh, something that I'm getting to get worked up over. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I think that actually the four or five second song is actually kind of interesting and it's a little better than the than the um, only one the first collaboration with Kanye West but this whole idea really doesn't you know really doesn't bother me a whole lot it's what he's doing and and I you know I'm fine with it you know I'm not going to get worked up over it anybody anybody want to say something about that I I think it's what's that I'm sorry Alan I, I was just agreeing with Steve and that's pretty much all I need to say so over to you Al (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and I, I I think it's uh, we you know because we talked about this previously, and again I think there's some you know musical um, in a sense almost musical racism involved here you know people most of the people that are making the comments on in social media are people that just don't like that you know the music that either Kanye West or Rihanna are associated with. Yeah, I found uh, the, um, you know, the Rihanna uh, recording a lot, uh, a lot better, a lot, uh, a lot more accessible than, uh, than the one with Kanye, because frankly, because she's, she's got a lot more talent going for her. I, I think people don't realize that, that Rihanna actually is very talented. Uh, it's just, unfortunately, she's better known for having, having lousy taste in boyfriends. You know. but, uh, well, see, that, I mean, that's the funny part, is that there, the whole idea of judgment on this has to do more with, not with their musical talent, but yeah. with their personalities. Yeah, you know, exactly. I've seen, you know, and I'm sure you guys have seen the comments about Kanye West. And uh, I haven't seen actually that many comments about Rihanna, but the Kanye West comments have been really strong. You know, when they've when people have objected, that's basically what they're objecting to, is is him, and uh, you know, mm-hmm. you know, it's it's what it is what it is, you know. Uh, on one hand, though, you have to at least give credit if you you know if you want to go that way for Paul for being uh, that open minded, you know, for that you know for branching out like that. I mean, I mean, it is really. What we were talking earlier about electronic sounds and everything like that. I mean, it is kind of the same area, you know, when the when you know a beetle goes into a, an area like this, it's not normally 
a beetle area, if you get what I'm saying. Um, oh, yeah. You no, know, it's, it's the same, it's the same thing. In, especially in Paul's case, though. I mean, he's he he goes in so many different directions musically, which he should obviously be given a good, a good deal of credit for. So this mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. really that big a stretch for him. You know, mm-hmm. especially given, and and again, we've talked about this before, especially given the his lifelong love for black music. Uh, so this is real, not really as 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 big a stretch as as I think maybe some people think, but it's just that people are just so opposed in any form to hip hop music. Mm-hmm. Because they consider, you know, they consider hip hop music gangster rap, even though gangster rap, in effect, hasn't really existed for, I don't know, some number of years now. Mm-hmm. But that's, you know, that's the image that they have. They have this stereotyped type image, and they figure, oh well, no, they've got Paul doing gangster rap, and of course, that's not the case at all. Right. Well, I think it, it goes beyond that too. I mean. I think that there's a lot of older fans who, for the most part, don't care at all about new music today. And exactly. they're going to object to any artist that Paul works with that's, you know, a hot artist of today or a young artist of today that they can't relate to. Well, so, I mean, to, that they can't relate to musically. Again, again, we discussed this before, the fact that, that those those same older fans don't have really seem to have any problem with him working with Dave Grohl. Mm. But there's all of this negative energy exerted toward the fact that he's working with more more particularly Kanye West, because mm-hmm. who has a, you know, a pretty bad image to begin with, much less so with Rihanna. Yeah. Right. And actually personally I I you know, I'm a less of a I'm not a big fan of Nirvana at all, and I, you know, the whole Dave Grohl thing is, is you know, kind of a sticky, you know, I haven't really paid much attention to that either, but that really is kind of a sticky wicket as far as I'm concerned. But on the other hand, he's, he's you know, like you say, Al, he's branching out wide, and that's, you know, that's what an artist does, you know. Yeah. There's going to be hits and misses. You can't, you know, he's not going to... You know, every, not everything he does is going to be a hundred percent. Not everything, you know, the Beatles did was a hundred percent. So, right. I know that there are probably some people who will disagree with with what I'm about to say, but you know, I, I find it really interesting whenever any artist that I admire collaborates with different people. And if anything, I wish Paul, in his solo career, had collaborated with more people than he has. You know, there's mm-hmm. so many talented people out there that I that I really look up to that I wish would work with Paul, and you know, I wish he'd do a lot more of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think the argument that that can be made with a lot of fans is, I'm sure that there's a lot of people closer to Paul's age bracket that we wish Paul would work with, and I don't disagree with that either. But you know, I find it fascinating when he works with different people. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that ends another another sterling episode of things we said today. Um, today was very it was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks again to Patty Boyd uh, for the phone call from England. Um, and uh, guys, uh, uh, I'll I'll let you go around the the table and say what you want to say as far as uh, you know people contacting you or if you have anything to say about the show. Starting, uh, I'll start with you, Al. Well, uh, you can contact me via Facebook, also uh, through my Twitter account, uh, at ASUS49. And um, those, are, those are probably the best, uh, you know, the best ways to contact me. You can also uh, contact me through Beetlefan at www.beetlefan.com, but most directly probably through Facebook or, or Twitter. Okay. Um, Alan? Okay, and you can reach me through Facebook, um, either at Alan Cozen or at Alan Cozen Remixed um, on Facebook. Um, on Twitter, I'm just at Cozen. So. Uh, Ken? I have my own Facebook page under Ken Michaels, and you can also look at my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com, 
And apart from having weekly trivia every single week in which you can win prizes on my website, every now and then there's a special contest that I'll run where there's a unique prize that I'm giving away. And so always check the website for that. And uh, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. And uh, don't forget that we here at Things We Said Today have our own Facebook page under the name of the show. And and you can contact the show at Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. You can contact me at Beatles Examiner at gmail.com. And I'm also on Facebook, and I have a Beatles News and Commentary group. And I'm all over Facebook, actually. Uh, there's, there's, it's hard not to see me on Facebook. But anyway, thanks again, uh, everybody, for tuning in. This is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.